All right. A lot of familiar faces. <laughs> Bra, is that you? Welcome, everyone. Uh, before we begin formally, we just want to give a couple of ground rules. We'll ask that for the time being, everybody, please mute your mics. If you have questions, and I'm sure you do, please be sure to put them in the chat box at the bottom. I promise that we can get to as many questions as possible. We're really thrilled tonight to be here with our special guest, basketball legend, Larry Brown. But before we go to Coach Brown, I'm gonna introduce our moderator for this evening, uh, Brian, or Shifty, as he's better known, Shifty Schiff. It first became involved with Maccabi USA back in 1998 when he was appointed head coach for USA Junior Boys Basketball in the ninth Pan American Maccabi Games in Mexico City. He went on to coach USA seven more times, including four times in Israel, once in Chile, once in Argentina, once in Berlin, once in Germany. Shifty has coached for over 25 years in the Philadelphia JCC Maccabi Games. He had a 30 year career in the media as a writer, editor, public relations director, and producer at Comcast Sportsnet in Philadelphia, which is where he knows Coach Brown. And currently serving as an assistant coach at Abington Friends School varsity ba boys basketball team and coaching middle school basketball as well. Uh, so Shifty lives in Exton, PA with Susan. Hi, Susan. Thanks for supporting <laughs> us tonight. And he's been a dedicated volunteer uh, and legend of Maccabi USA. Uh, for many years. So Shifty, thank you for uh, moderating tonight and I will let you take it from here. Okay. Thanks Shane. Really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I've had a lot of honors in my life, but uh, this is right up there with the top. I love Larry Brown. Larry is truly one of the iconic figures in the world of basketball. What do you get if you take an NCAA champion, an Olympic champion, an NBA champion, a Hall of Famer, a Maccabea champion, and a legend of the Maccabea, what you get is Larry Brown. Uh, Larry will, he probably won't want me to say this, but he's going to be 80 in September. He's the only coach, as probably many of you know, in basketball coach in history that has won an NCAA championship with Kansas Jayhawks in 88 and an NBA title with the Detroit Pistons in 2004. His overall coaching record, in the, he coached in the ABA also, was – 1,275 and 965. He's the only coach in NBA history to lead eight different teams to the playoffs. As a player, Larry didn't play in the NBA, but he played in the ABA where his team, the Oakland Oaks, won the 1968-69 championship. He was on the USA Olympic team, which won a gold medal in Tokyo in 1964. That team went 9-0. and No, Only one game was under 10 points. He was the head coach of the USA Olympic team in 2004 in Athens, and he was an assistant coach in Sydney in 2000. Um, and directly for us, Larry in 1961 led the USA team, and we're going to get to this in a minute, but he led the USA team to a gold medal at the sixth World Maccabee Games. That was in Israel in 1961. He actually was a seventh round pick. Remember back in those days, they had that many rounds in the NBA draft. Larry was a seventh round pick, the 55th overall, by the Baltimore Bullets. And besides Kansas, Larry was both the head coach at UCLA and at SMU in college. Born in Brooklyn, he played in college at famous, of course, University of North Carolina. First, he played for the legendary coach, Frank McGuire, and then he played for the even more legendary, Dean Smith. Um, from 1997 to 2003, Larry was the coach of the Sixers in my hometown here, and that was how I got to know him, as Shane said, as I worked at Comcast Sportsnet, which is the station that aired all the Sixers games at the time. Uh, the 2001 76ers that made it to the NBA Finals and lost to the Lakers is probably the most revered non-championship team in Philadelphia sports history, and we're going to talk to Larry about this, but half of those guys were injured, and we had Allen Iverson, and circumstances were a little bit different than uh, those Sixers might have pulled off the greatest um, upset in NBA history. Just a couple other quickies. Larry's in the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. 
He's, of course, in the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. It was in 2002. The National College Basketball Hall of Fame, 2006, was named the Legend of the Maccabee in 2012, and the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame in 2013. So a resume that is uh, not like anyone else's in the world. When people call people, you know, it's a big thing when you're a basketball coach, calling everyone coach. There's nobody more of the coach than Coach Larry Brown. So thank you, Larry, and welcome. Thanks, Shifty. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to thank you enough for saying all those lies, but I appreciate you. I appreciate our relationship. Uh, I haven't back, been back to Israel since 1961. It was an amazing experience. Uh, I got to meet a lot of my relatives that I never would have met before. Um, and you know, my brother spent some time over there coaching and being connected with the Maccabee games as well. But uh, I remember playing at Raman Gan Stadium uh, and I just loved every minute of it. And something, I'm, I'm ashamed I haven't been back. Uh, so hopefully someday when this silliness with this virus clears up, maybe I can come back. Well, our, the games that were supposed to be next year were already pushed back once. We're going to uh, see what we can do to get you over there for the next games, which are currently scheduled for 2022. So <laughs> that Larry, would be great. Larry was named the legend of the Maccabee in 2012, and the organization put together this little video about him, and we are going to uh, show that. It's about three minutes long, so everybody watch. Shane, we're having some trouble. Hang on. Okay. Good? Yeah, here we go. I wanted to be, you know, involved in the Maccabee games because it's such a great experience for me. You know, obviously, when you're in the United States and you realize, you know, what that country has become since the year I went, 1961, where they are today, uh, I take a lot of pride in what's been accomplished over there. And to be able to represent our country as an athlete in 1961 and then being an Olympic athlete in 64 and a coach for the U.S. Olympic team, I take great pride in that as well. I think athletics have a way of uh, bringing people closer together. Anybody that could represent the, our country and, and play in games like that would, would certainly benefit, not only in basketball, but, you know, culturally as well. To be honored with the group of people that are legends of, of Maccabee is, is pretty neat. Uh, you know, I don't take those things lightly. Well done, Coach. Boy, you were young a, ones, weren't you? I need a haircut. Uh, <laughs> my kids won't let me get a haircut, so I apologize. My wife just did mine yesterday and today, in fact. It was a two-day number. So yeah, my, daughter, my daughter's going to cut my hair tonight or tomorrow. We'll see. <laughs> so, Larry, give us a little uh, recollection. My first question even was, what, how did you find out about the Maccabee Games, and what were the tryouts like then? Well, um, there were no tryouts actually, and oh, I was I was at a summer camp, and I got a call from Haskell Cohn, I think, and a, a coach named Duty Moore was coaching the team. He was a close friend of Haskell, and they 
they told the people at my camp that I was selected and they had a huge carnival at my camp to raise money and, and they raised a lot of money, which enabled a lot of other guys who weren't as fortunate as I was, you know, to go. Artie Heyman was one of them. And, you know, Artie and I played high school ball against each other, played AAU together. And we both signed to go to Carolina together. And his stepdad had an argument with Coach McGuire, and he ended up going to Duke. But he was on our team. He was a great player. Um, I remember we didn't stay in the village. We stayed at a neat hotel. I think it was called the Acadia or something in Tel Aviv, overlooking um, the Mediterranean, if I remember. And uh, we were treated royalty. We played outdoors. The competition was much better than I anticipated. Um, and I got a lot out of it. Uh, my coach was great and he let me play, um, which was a thrill. And then the biggest thing after we were finished, four of us got on a couple of Vespers and we drove all around and played a lot of games in the, some of the kibbutzes. Um, and each, each uh, kibbutz had a team and that was really competitive. And I think that was probably as much fun as actually participating in the games itself. And what I really remember is when I got there, I met a lot of my relatives that, you know, didn't come to the United States, which I never would have met. And then I, I participated in 64, but I was also participated in some other Olympic games. And I remember every time I went, the Israeli contingent would look me up and I got to meet a lot of athletes from Israel that participated in different sports. And that was certainly a highlight as well. Awesome. So being a little bit of a former journalist that I am, I did a little digging and I don't know, I don't know what your screen looks like, Larry. However, on this Zoom call tonight is the following people, Steve Steinberg, Charlie Rosen, Jules Cohen, Art Brandon, Sid Amira, Mike Singeiser, oh my God. Sandy Pomerantz, and Rick Kaminsky, eight of your former teammates who were on your team in 61 in the games. They are, they are currently on the Zoom watching. So if you want to say hello to everyone, go ahead. Oh, and Ed, oh. And Ed Masria also. Oh, my God. That's a, that was an amazing group. You know, Sandy Pomeranz and I took some trips together. Um, I think when I was in high school, he might have been the number one player in America. I think he signed with Cincinnati and then went to the University of Washington at St. Louis. But what a team. What a group, great group of guys. Um, I'm so happy to, that they're on. It's a shame that we haven't had some kind of reunion and kept in touch, but, you know, I, I remember that group very well. Well, I do have everyone's email addresses and phone numbers now. And, and Mike, Sing Mike Singheiser was a, a rival of ours. He went to West Hempstead High School in his sophomore year. They upset the best team on Long Island. My high school team, Mike was amazing, and he was an amazing coach, and he's gone through some health issues, and I'm happy he's around. Yeah, he's on so, there. Um, so I only wasn't able to get in touch with a couple of people, Bert Price, yeah. Morgan Rosenblatt, and Bruce Babbage. I couldn't find them, but they seemed but how about, how, 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 about you, how about Judy Cohn, Julie Cohn? Yeah, he's on. He's oh, on great. Here. Julie's on here. But and passed away, unfortunately, has been uh, David Waxman, Barry right. Butler, Stan Greenberg, Sam Grossman, Art Heyman, and Arnie Single, and yes, and Duty Moore also. So uh, we wanted to give them a little shout out too, as uh, as all your uh, your teammates from that time. Now I'd like to uh, get into one thing, which is. Duke, North Carolina. So I didn't know that Art Heyman was supposed to go, but I was told by somebody that 
your rivalry with Art, which went back through high school and then went, been, went through college also, that you guys still had a little uh, contentiousness between you with the Duke, North Carolina thing, even going back to then. Is that true? He had it for me, but I never had it for him. I, I admired him. But, uh, you know, his town was the next town over. He used to come to my playground, which was a famous playground with all great college players and high school players, even pro players used to come. And then they'd go to the beach. And I'd get in a fight with Artie about every other Saturday or Sunday because he wouldn't pass the ball. <laughs> but but he but he was he was a sensational player little different we got in a fight in college they said that initiated the rivalry between Carolina and Duke and that's not true that you know <laughs> it happened long before I was there but uh Artie was special and we did we were supposed to room together we actually signed a letter of intent but his stepdad got in an argument with Coach McGuire, and he released him. And I think it turned out great for him. You know, he played for a coach that allowed him to play and did it, did unbelievably well. Now, one of your teammates also told me that, like you said before, that you stayed in a beautiful place. One of your teammates, and I forget who which one it was, said that the first place you guys were scheduled to stay in was not very nice, but right. then Art made, like, a huge stink about it. And even, like – threatened to quit and leave if they didn't move them to somewhere nicer and then they did <laughs> well i don't know about that but that doesn't surprise me that art would complain that was uh, that was what i heard for sure so, well my my big job was i don't know if my teammates remember this but i used to have to get um, our coach out of the the bar at night <laughs> and put him to bed <laughs> they didn't tell me that one, but that would have been funny. That's great. So um, everyone loves hearing stories about you and Al Alan. It's a legendary thing, of course, in the history of basketball. So regale us with a couple of Alan stories that maybe we don't otherwise wouldn't know, that, you're, that you think you're allowed to spill. Well, you see the color of my hair. <laughs> I think I was... I had all my hair and it was dark and I was healthy. But uh, every day was a challenge with Alan. Um, but he was probably the greatest competitor I've ever been around. Maybe the toughest guy I've ever been around and maybe the greatest athlete I've ever seen. Um, you know, I wish I knew now um, about some of the issues that we're facing here in our country with all this unrest and because a lot of Alan's behavior maybe was because of you know how he was brought up you know he's sent to prison as 16 year old so you could understand some of the things that he went through that maybe caused his behavior to be a certain way but we became really close. I love him. I'm so thankful I got to coach him. I let him shoot 38 times a game and go to the free throw line as much as he could. And I think he loves me because of that. Uh, um, about practice, you know, that's obvious. But I, I love the fact that he didn't practice because I got a lot more accomplished. Um, but as long as he showed up to play, you know, at the level he did, I think myself, my staff, and our whole team respected that. Uh, am I allowed to curse a little bit? Of course. All right. Well, I'll give you a great story. A lot of people have been asked me to write a book, um, and I've always been reluctant to do it because I only want to write about things that were positive in my life because of the <laughs> players I played with and the coaches I played for and the coaches that have sat next to me. But I know the title of my book. Um, I coached Allen 600 games. Um, the first time I coached him, I, I used to take him out about the 10 minute mark in the first quarter, give him a long rest, put him in early in the second quarter and let him finish the half. And then I'd take him out, you know, late in the third quarter, give him a long rest, 
and put them in, you know, about eight or nine or 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter and let him finish out. The first time I took him out, he walked by the bench and called me an MF. And I, I jumped up and I wanted to fight. Um, and my, my staff pulled me down and said, no, 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 just let it go, Larry. I'm sure he just doesn't like to come out of the game and he won't do it again. And same thing happened in the third quarter. And I had the same response. I was a little upset. Um, and this happened every game I ever coached him. So I coached him 600 times. So my, my book would be t entitled, I've been MF 1200 times by <laughs> Alan Iverson. So, That's a, but, if, but if he was playing today, the way you can't get near a guy and can't touch a guy, he'd probably average 50 a game. So th that leads me to my next question about um, about those 2001 NBA Finals. Of course, Game One, the famous game when Allen stepped over Tyrone Lue and and the Sixers won that game. And I think the sec Game Two was close the whole time. I think you might even have had a lead. I'm not 100% sure of that. I know you cut it to three late in the game, also, but you had some major injuries then too. Like let's re. Uh, rewrite history like what happened if you didn't have injuries and even if just you would have been able to pull out that game too well we missed a whole bunch of fouls game two but George Lynch had a broken foot he couldn't play Matt Garger didn't play but one game really and that was game one but I found out later on that he broke Thack, uh, Shaq's thumb so he was reluctant to play but I'll give you a great story. After he played game one and we won, he came up to me and said, Coach, I don't think I can go game two. And I said, why? He said, well, my knee, knees bother me. I said, look, all you have to do is stand outside and shoot a jump shot. Shaq's not going to come, you know, after you. And then with you and Matumbo and Todd McCullough, we got enough fouls that we can get through this game. But they asked Todd to play against Shaq. You know, it's just not fair. He's a rookie and not, not ready yet. So I decided to, you know, maybe I can inspire him. So I put on a film. I got my video guy to put on a film of Kurt Gibson hitting the home run for the Dodgers and limping around first base. And then I put Isaiah up when he got bloodied and could hardly walk on his ankle and played the fourth quarter and and was phenomenal. And then I ended it with Willis Reed coming into the garden when they, the Knicks beat the Lakers and won the championship. And as I was leaving to get ready to play the game, Geiger was dressed and he came up to me, put his arm around me and said, coach, that was so inspirational. I can't believe it, but I still can't go coach. <laughs> But I, I don't know if we would have beaten the Lakers. You know, Eric had a stress fracture. We didn't have Geiger and, and George, and they were two starters. Um, but the Lakers were phenomenal that, you know, that year. But I, I think, you know, like you said, everywhere I go, people look at me. They don't know my name, but they know I coached Allen. <laughs> and more people have told me that's their favorite team, the Sixers. Um, 2001 and then that's why I think we beat them in 2004 because uh, I told our team you know that we were good enough I thought in 2001 to give them a run for their money but I thought the 2004 team in Detroit was so much deeper we won game one I blew game two because we should have fouled we were up three with eight seconds to go and I couldn't get them to to foul and Kobe made a great shot. We lost in overtime, but I remember getting on the bus and driving back. I told the guys, I said, you know, I took the same kind of bus ride. We were one and one leaving the Lakers when I was with Philly. And I said, we can't have this, you know, happen again. Before I finished, Ben Wallace said, coach, we're not Philly and we ain't coming back. <laughs> so, and they told me something else to sit my butt down and, you know, enjoy the flight. But we won the next 
you know, three games very handily with an unbelievable team. But I think the experience we had with Philly helped us achieve that with Detroit. Well, my brother-in-law, Sid Carden, who is from Detroit, and he's a huge Pistons fan, and who was on this also, he thanks you forever. On behalf of all Pistons fans everywhere. Well, so, thank you. Speaking of that, though, just talk, I mean, this year, you know, one of the, before the COVID tragedy happened, there was the, the uh, death of Kobe. Just talk about uh, what you thought Kobe meant to the NBA, what kind of player, person, and all that stuff he was. Well, I, I knew a lot about Kobe. I remember Tony DeLeo told me about Kobe. He said he used to, you know, kick the guy's ass when he worked out with him in high school. Um, and I was with Indiana at the time. We had the 10th pick. John Calipari, who worked for me at Kansas and then with Philly, he was with the Nets. I think they had the 8th or ninth pick. And um, I sent I won't tell you the guy's name. I sent somebody to scout Kobe and told him how much I liked him. And our scout came back and told, told my GM and president he wasn't ready, wasn't good enough. But um, John wanted to draft Kobe with the Nets, and their ownership said if they couldn't, he couldn't. But then he talked him into it finally, and they said, all right, if Kerry Kittles is not available, we'll let you draft Kobe. Kobe knew that I, I knew a lot about him, and he joked with me and John one time. He said, if John would have drafted me, he'd still be with New Jersey. And he said, if I drafted him, I'd still be with Indiana. <laughs> um, and he's probably, probably right, but... Um, he was one guy that was great on both ends of the court. You know, a lot of times you protect your great player and don't let him guard the best guy every night. Um, but Kobe always took that challenge, similar to Michael, um, similar to what Phil let Michael do, because Michael had so much pride in that, that end of the court as well. But... Uh, that was what separated me in so many ways with Kobe when you talk about one of the greatest of all time. And then he was an unbelievable person. And, I, you know, when he passed away, he was taking his daughter to an AAU event and he championed women's basketball, which I think we need more people doing that, you know, high profile people like Kobe. Um, and then, you know, he did that documentary and won an Academy Award. And I felt he was going to do so much more with his life after basketball, which would have been an unbelievable example for so many of our players today. Um, he was just a special guy in, in, in my mind. Uh, and, and it's a terrible loss, but, you know, Alan told me, and I think he said it publicly, Kobe played 20 years. I think Alan, Shifty, you might correct me. I think Alan played about 12, um, I something think he like that. 12 or 13, yeah. Alan said that when he was coming in from the club at 6 o'clock in the morning, Kobe was getting up and working out, <laughs> and that was the difference. So, And it doesn't surprise me because Allen was that kind of player and had he taken a little better care of himself and he admitted it, I'm sure he would have done even more than he did, which was pretty incredible. Now, being that you coached an NCAA champion and an NBA champion, and you were part of championship teams as a player too, is there a common thread that you can think of that, that championship teams have? There's, there's a lot of coaches on this, uh, on the Zoom, I'm sure they'd love to hear like a psychological kind of thing or, or something that you can instill in your players that, you know, what makes a champion? Well, I only took one team that had a winning, took over one team that had a winning record in the NBA and that was Detroit. And Rick Carlisle had coached them and he lost four straight in the playoffs and they fired him, but he, he was really successful and I think he had good values, so that, that really helped me. Um, 
you know, every time I coached the team or we went to practice or anything, I wrote play hard, play smart, play together, have fun. And then I asked Coach Smith if it were all right if I said it'd be nice if we rebounded and defended. Um, <laughs> and I think that's the most important thing. The other thing I think, players got to trust you. You know, every time I took a new job, after two practices, they know whether you can coach or not. And that's important. And then the second thing that's important is the – they think you, they can win with you. Um, and then the third thing that's important is, can you make them better? Because if you make them better, they're going to make more money. But the thing that I thought trumped everything is that if they trust you and if they know you care about them. And that's the most difficult thing with players today. You know, when I was growing up, if a coach got on you, and you went home and complained, your mom would tell you, tell me, hey, he cares about you. That's why he's coaching you. And I think players today have a difficult time understanding the difference between coaching and criticism. Because when you correct somebody or try to make them do something better, you're not criticizing them. You're, you're trying to help him improve. And And the most important thing is if a teammate is sitting on the bench and he's happy when you do well, you really got something going. Um, I don't think a coach can change the culture entirely himself. He has to have the players buy in and then usually it's the older players. And unfortunately now we have so many young players playing, they're not ready and a lot of coaches are afraid to coach them. And if you look at old films now, when I was watching The Last Dance, which I thought was incredible, and Charlie was on it. You know, Charlie's a big, big fan of Phil's, and he should. Good book about him. Um, and he should, because the guy has done amazing things. But the thing I got out of The Last Dance, so many things, but you didn't see any young players playing. They were all older guys, veteran guys. When you say I was a seventh round pick, I was 55th, you know, selection. That'd be in the second round now. And I probably had a guaranteed contract and I wasn't probably wasn't good enough. But, you know, these young kids go to teams, they get drafted on potential and people are afraid to coach them. A lot of people say when they don't make it, they fail. Our system fails them. Because Kareem stayed four years, Michael stayed three, Oscar st stayed four, Wilt went three years and then played a year with the Globetrotters, Bill Russell went four. They say if you're 22, you're over the hill, you can't get better. I don't buy it. And the great teams have a great locker room and have guys like Michael that have so much pride and every time they step out on the court, whether it's practice or game, they're trying to bring it and make their players on their team play up to their level. And I don't think kids understand that yet because they don't have locker rooms that are that strong that enable kids to grow and get better. Awesome answer. Thanks, Larry. Um, before we continue, I don't know if they're all on here because it's hard to go through all the screens, but I just wanted to give a little shout out because we have so many Maccabee people who have been – coaching for years and years are on here. So I just wanted to give a quick mention. I know Bruce Pearl signed up. Uh, my first original Maccabee hero, Marty Rigger, who was the coach of Brentwood High School, who I believe you know from growing up, Larry as well. Coach Howard Fisher, Jeff Klein, Sherry Levin, Donna Orander, Max Sass. Um, a kid I met who was on the Turkey team in 2001 when I was coaching the juniors named, named Sirhat Sarit. He saw this and he told me he was joining in. From Maccabi Canada, Irv Mintz. Um, Danny Hers, one of my closest friends, is the coach in Florida and was the coach of one of our teams in Brazil. Art Kratchman, Mitchell Kurtz, Howard Levy, John Kalen, Stan Pluchek, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of Maccabee legends on this call. I thank everyone for being on. I have so many questions I wrote down, but Larry, we have so many people asking questions in the chat. I'm going to go to them and let other people 
chime in. So I'm going to go to the first one I see, which is from Scott Chislowitz, and he wants to know how difficult was it to do your job when you were the coach of the Knicks, given what the ownership at the time, how they were? Well, you are what your record is. So I didn't do a real good job. Um, I think the only way you can be successful as a coach is if everybody's attached at the hip. You might not agree all the time, but ultimately there's only one voice. Um, the places that I struggled most was when I didn't have a relationship with the coach and the general manager and president. Um, and I think that's critical that everybody's on the same page. My biggest problem with the Knicks is I didn't go to Jim Dolan and share my values and ideas with him. And so when he would hear things about me, he was never really getting the message that I was trying to convey. But he would do anything to help you win in terms of giving you the financial aid, you know, the financial backing you, you really needed. My big problem was I didn't establish a relationship with him. And I think that was, that was a big mistake. Um, you know, you look around the NBA, the teams that are successful, they have a great owner, probably a great president, probably an outstanding coach. And they all might not agree with everything, but when it's all said and done, nobody gets between them. And that connection is critical. And I don't think I, I did a good enough job in New York to, to establish that. All right, great. All right, Andrew Lipkin, he wants to know, which player would you have lo most liked to have coached that you didn't have a chance to? <laughs> um. I'd hate to even say that there, you know, so many guys that I coached, um, I was blessed, you know, to be part of their lives. And, and I think all the coaches that sat next to me and, you know, guys that went on to be head coaches and GMs. Uh, but there were so many great ones. When I was a little kid, Koozie was somebody that I admired and my coach used to get mad at me trying to, when I tried to do so many of the things that he did quite naturally, I saw Bill Russell, you know, playing the holiday festival in the garden. They happened to go 60 and 0 in two straight years and win a championship. Um, I grew up loving Will Chamberlain. Um, I grew up, I went to Oscar Robinson's first college game in Madison Square Garden when he was a sophomore at Cincinnati. And he scored 54 or 56 points. I'm not exactly sure. And they forgot that they invited me to the game when they were recruiting me. And my uncle was pissed. And I, I, and I wouldn't let my uncle make, let me leave. And I wanted to wait around. And there was so much commotion. He, I think he tied Seton Hall by himself. The score was like a, 102 to 50. Six, I don't know, 112, 56, something like that. But that was a performance I, I couldn't believe. Um, and growing up, I used to go to the garden when the Globetrotters came in and played Saturday afternoon and Saturday night, and I wanted to be like Marcus Haynes. So, I mean, but there's, there's so many people that I could look at and say, God, I wish I would have been part of their careers. But this this show wouldn't be long enough. Um, since we are doing this in regards to Maccabi USA too, so how about um, a couple things I wanted to ask you. What, this actually comes from Jonathan Schiffman, who is no re relative, but um, any time during your career, either pro or college, that you encountered any kind of anti-Semitism? No. Um, you know, I talk about that a lot. You know, a lot of my good friends when I went to North Carolina, you know, happened to be from the East and were Jewish and they would talk about things and Artie did, you know, Artie had a lot of that. I remember he told me, I roomed with Harvey Sauls, who was a senior and Jewish. 
and he told me some things. Lenny Roosevelt was there before me and an unbelievable player. But I never, you know, felt like that was an issue. Only one time um, I, I had a guy, you know, basically tell me, uh, you know, I didn't realize Jewish guys look like you. And <laughs> that kind of blew me away. And then I, I said, you probably saw the statue of David and thought I had horns. And he, <laughs> he didn't have an answer for that. But um, maybe my name being Brown, but I used to wear a Star David or a mezuzah when I played. Um, and Coach McGuire, you know, used to call me and – and he didn't do it in a bad way, but he told me he went all over the country looking for a smart Jewish kid. And, <laughs> he found and, one. He, I, and I said, why, why, why did you think that? He said, well, I thought you'd be careful with the ball. <laughs> and he said he found out that I played like an Irishman and left me alone. So. <laughs> nice. So back to Alan, like recently there's been a little controversy with him when Deshaun, Mac, uh, Deshaun Jackson made those comments um, with all the thing going on racially. And then Alan tweeted that picture of, of him and Louis Farrakhan. Like, what do you think about that? What would you have said to Alan about what he should have done in those circumstances? Well, I just tell him to read what, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote. I thought that letter was, you know, was incredible. Um, and it meant a lot to me. I, I called some people after I wrote, wrote, read what Deshaun said. I coached Steven Jackson. Um, I'm surprised. I was surprised the Eagles' response, especially after the uh, way people reacted when Drew Brees talked about kneeling and respecting the anthem. And then when you consider Jeffrey Laurie, is, you know, I love the guy the owner of the Eagles, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to see anybody punished for saying something stupid that they don't really think about, but I don't see anything about the anti-Semitism you see in our country now. I don't see anybody speaking up and I was so proud of Kareem and then hearing Charles Barkley's comments made me feel good. So we just got to bring everybody together and I don't think it, there's leadership out there and anybody has a clue to do it. I wish they'd understand how a team is. You know, if you're a member of a team, the things that really matter, are you a decent person and can you play? And if our country would think about things like that, like how a team is and understand those things are critical, we'd be much better off. Um, my good friend and Princeton legend and Maccabee legend, Howard Levy, he would love to know what you saw in a young Greg Popovich that had you hire him and how you see Pop's career evolved as it has into uh, also one of the all-time greats. Well, if any, anybody gets a chance, they ought, there was a neat article written in The Athletic about you know, my time at Kansas and all the people that touched my life while I was there. Um, Calipari, Bill Self, Pop, Alvin Gentry, Ed Manning, um, Kevin Pritchard, Milt Newton that are GMs in the league. I even have managers that are in the NBA. Um, I can go on and on with that staff, R.C. Buford. But um, I knew Pop because of the relationship Coach Smith had with the Air Force Academy. Um, that was his first coaching job, actually. He worked for Bob Spear, who's the he head coach of the academy, before it actually moved to Colorado Springs. It was actually in Denver the first year. Um, and I got to know Pop because of that relationship between Coach Spear and Coach Smith, and then Hank Egan, who became very close to Pop and I were close. Um, Greg was doing a internship, a sabbatical, excuse me, at one year when he was at Pomona Pitzer. 
and he was at Chapel Hill early in October before our practice started. Coach used to invite me to talk basketball, and I didn't very I didn't talk very much. I just listened and learned, but. I noticed Pop wasn't having the complete access that I I could give him at KU. So I told him to come with me, sit on the bench, help us coach. So he did, and he spent the, the rest of the year with us. You know, nobody could predict he was going to be, you know, as good a coach as we have in our sport. Just like you couldn't predict John Calipari or Bill Self or Alvin or Bob Hill, I can go on and on. But he was really a good guy. He was a terrific player. Uh, Mr. Iba, after I played on the Olympic team, had, had me help with a lot of Olympic teams. You know, Coach Smith asked me to be an Olympic coach with him in 76, but I was a pro coach and they wouldn't let me come. But, but Pop was inquisitive. And I think you never can stop trying to learn and get better. Um, He could handle people. He wasn't afraid of coach, which I think a lot of people now are afraid of coach young kids. And he wasn't afraid to include people. You know, the people that worked for Pop, you know, he allowed them to have input and had a unique way of telling guys how to play hard and play together and sacrifice for the best interest of the team and wasn't afraid to tell you, you know, what he had in mind for you in order to help the team be successful. But, um, you know, people say I, you know, a lot of guys have a tree. I have a forest and, uh, you know, I'm so proud of that because the people that sit next to you and the players that you coach, are the ones that allow you to do extraordinary things. When uh, Bill Guthridge, I, I forget exactly where you were at this time, but when Bill Guthridge retired from North Carolina, was that a job you ever uh, thought maybe you'd like to have going back to your alma mater? Well, coach used to ask me all the time where I wanted to coach because I came back after the Olympics and coached with him for two years and then went to the ABA. And he told me I'd never get a job. But, um, <laughs> you know, when he asked me where I wanted to coach, I said, I want to coach Carolina naturally, but I don't want to see you ever re- retire. Mm-hmm. And then he said, well, where would you like to coach? And I'd say, well, Princeton, Vanderbilt, Northwestern, or Stanford. And he said, why would you want those schools? I said, well, they're great academically and they're in great conferences and they have pretty good tradition. And at 70, I got offered this Stanford job and turned it down like a fool. <laughs> but um, when coach retired, I was at training camp, you know, with the Sixers. And he told me Bill Guthridge was going to take the job. And he, he forced Bill to take it because he retired a week before the season started. And he left Bill an unbelievable team. And then after Bill resigned, he called me and said, I recommended Roy first because he's in college and you're in the pros. But if he doesn't take it, you're going to be the next coach in North Carolina. And Roy's still there. (laughs) Roy didn't take it. Um, They came to interview me and the AD didn't spend an hour and a half telling me why Roy should have taken it. And then... um, I called Coach Smith. He asked me how my interview went. I said, I don't think Bedour wants me to be the coach. He said, it doesn't matter, Larry. You're going to be the next coach. And I said, no, Coach, I don't need you to fight it. Um, I'm perfectly all right. So it it was one of the biggest disappointments I've ever had. But as it turned out, you know, I landed on my feet. Uh, a gentleman named Bruce Apple is on this call. He is one of our uh, longtime coaches, mainly with golf, right, Bruce, or tennis? And uh, he was a physical trainer at the university. In fact, why don't you unmute and you can tell him yourself, Bruce. Can you unmute Bruce, Shane? 
Bruce, can you Hello. unmute yourself? Go ahead. Can you hear me? I hear you. There was this 1978-79 basketball season, Larry, and you were the coach of the Denver Nuggets. And the chairman of my program took us to the Air Force Academy for three or four days. And we had the opportunity to uh, do strength training and some uh, physical fitness testing on your players. And I never got a chance to meet you, but you, the practices that you ran, I mean, guys like Dan and David Thompson, and uh, I believe Bobby Jones, and uh, these guys couldn't have been nicer. And I enjoyed so much watching you run these practices. And they told us, they told us that you were out running about six to eight miles. <laughs> we, we never saw you. And then I ended up on my feet in a, uh, uh, running a, uh, owning an orthopedic school physical therapy practice in South Jersey. And I got to watch you from the side of Philadelphia Sixers. And uh, uh, your, your coaching expertise is, is beyond words. It's, it's been amazing watching you. And, and I would love to see you coach again if you have any uh, desire to do that. Yeah, I, uh, well, I appreciate it. I was a serious runner. Um, matter of fact, I made my coaches run with me because when you're running and sweating and competing with each other, they tell you things that you need to hear. Um, and I used to get so much input when I ran with my staff. Um, they tell me things if I mistreated a player or I acted silly. Um, it was just amazing. And then plus, I thought it was really important for our players to know that we cared enough about ourselves to keep ourselves fit. Um, but being at the academy was wonderful for me. Um, and then your last question about would I like to coach again? I, I got so much to share with people, but I think most people think I'm a threat from what I heard, which I can't believe. And most people think I'm too old. And I thought the older you get, the smarter you get. But I, I think that's been an issue that they think older people don't relate to young players and I can't figure that out but uh if you look at who I played for and who I coached and who sat beside me somehow some way I'd like to share that with people and I've been lucky you know recently with this pandemic I've been on so many coaching clinics and things similar to this um, and I've been able to share things that I was taught, and it's been pretty neat. But at the end of the day, I learn more than I, I give, which is fun also. Well, you've been a tremendous uh, inspiration to all of us. Uh, my mentor who helped set me up in business, Pat Croce, I think you know him <laughs> oh, yeah. pretty, pretty well. So maybe you can comment on uh, your relationship with Pat. Well, he... Um, he came to visit me when my wife was pregnant and about to give birth. Um, but he didn't want me originally. Sonny Hill talked him into going after me. Um, but he was the greatest asset for me because all the things that I didn't like to do, he loved to do. He loved to be out in public. He was so positive. He had a way of bringing people together. Um, he just, he just was really, really good to be, you know, a partner with in trying to build our team back up to where the people of Philly were used to seeing it. Uh, you know, and again, when I was saying you can't be successful unless everybody's on the same page, and with Ed Snyder and Pat and Billy King and my staff and myself, um, there were a lot of disagreements, but nobody really knew if there were any. And everybody was real supportive of one another. And Pat was a really, really good leader and a good representative for the Sixers and the people in Philly loved him. All right, Larry, just a couple more. You have... You've had so much incredible success, obviously, as we've been talking the whole time. But I'm sure, well, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was always trying to get you to coach the Maccabea team, 
there was at one time, and it has been 2003, I guess, when I was asking you about the Maccabee, it was coming in 2005, but you told me you might be the Olympic coach in 2004, and you were kind of waiting to hear. And then you got the Olympic job, and I remember I went to practice, and I said to you, Larry, Maccabee Olympics, and you're like, yeah, well, you know, what could I do? They wouldn't be doing it. But, <laughs> but that team um, underachieved. What do you no, think? no, 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 stop. Stop. Okay, and that's why I'm asking you. The Tell me. 2003 team went through the Tournament of Americas, and we beat everybody like a dream. And they won the gold medal in 2004. And people don't realize, at that time, they selected the team. There were no tryouts, no practices, really. We had eight practices before we went. And we had, a, we had to come in at least second to qualify for the Olympics. And then 9-11 happened. You know, none of the guys on that team would go to the Olympic Games hardly. And the games were played in Greece. And we had no practice time because Pop set up the schedule. And we were going to play games in Europe to get ready. And the team that we selected in 2003 was much different than the team they gave us in 2004. That's they true. just put a team together. And then people don't realize this. You know, in 2006, I think we came in third or sixth with 95 practices because Jerry Coangelo changed the way they picked the team. And now they spend four years building that team. Right. So we were we were behind a rock in a hard place. And, and again, you know, it's an excuse, but I think because we struggled in 2004, they try to finally figured out the best way to do it. And then look what happened this year with pop, you know, they didn't, they had very little time to get that team together. They had more practices than we had. They, they selected the team but a lot of guys refused to go and you saw what happened to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So don't tell me we underachieved. I okay. don't buy that. One. I misspoke. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> um, so finally we're getting ready to wrap it up. So the NBA is having going about to have the strangest season ever. How would you go about if you were one of the coaches getting your team together? This is a two part question. How would you go about getting your team together here? And then give us a prediction on what is then going to happen in these NBA playoffs that are upcoming. Well, I, I never was really complicated, Shifty. I, you know, I, uh, I think we ran our practices just like a college. You know, we were pretty simple defensively, but that was the key to how we played. We wanted to share the ball. We want to rebound like crazy and play harder than anybody. So I don't think, you know, we'd be real complicated. I don't think you can. You got to hope your players are in, you know, the kind of shape that it's going to take to be successful. Because if they don't come in shape, you don't have time to get them in condition. You got to work on how you can put them in the best position where they can be successful. I'm worried about the pandemic. You know, I don't think we've, we've had the kind of leadership that people are aware that, you know, this virus is really serious. I hope, I hope that everybody can stay healthy. Um, I'm disappointed that, you know, eight teams were left out of this. You know, the teams that, you know, didn't qualify they missed 17 games that they would have played with some of their younger players that could have improved. And now they're not even allowed to participate in this. And then you see guys that are leaving the bubble and you don't know exactly why. Um, but I think it's going to be crazy. Um, just like baseball playing 60 games. I think that's hard for me to grasp, even though I know we need these sports to be played. We need people to have something to, to do and feel good about. So I just don't know what to expect. Um, 
Milwaukee's been tremendous. I hope they'll have a chance to play for a championship. You know, the Lakers have done a great job. The Clippers have done a great job. There's some teams that, you know, that have surprised. I, I just I just want the best team to win and everybody to stay healthy and have an opportunity to enjoy it. Okay. Well, it is a couple minute, couple minutes after nine, so this looks like we're going to wrap it up. Is there anything else that you would uh, like to say to wrap? No, I hope I can get to Israel at some point um, before it's too late. I hope I can have a reunion with all these guys that I was lucky enough to participate with in 1961 because that was a thrill for me. You know, the playing in the games and then traveling with a bunch of them. Um, and I, I just can't thank you enough for just – including me in this this is uh spring back it brings back great memories i'm sorry i look like this but uh i'm gonna go out and get get myself in shape and if they ever need me to come and smell the gym in israel i'm always available <laughs> well i know i'd love to have you if you remember my whole reason of trying to get you to coach that time was because i wanted to come and be your assistant and just listen to your stories for two and a half weeks. Well, now I can be your assistant someday, Shifty. <laughs> okay, that'd be good. I'll, I'll accept that too. All I'll right. even let you come play once in a while if you want. All right, well. Well, on behalf just, of everyone at Maccabi USA and especially me, like I said, I started this out that uh, I've been honored and blessed in my life being able to do a lot of things. This was absolutely a... Uh, a highlight for me. So I can't thank you enough for bringing to do, bring to do this. I hope everyone who was on here had a great time. And um, thanks to everybody for joining. And maybe uh, in the future, we'll do one again. Or maybe in the future, we won't have to do that anymore because the world will be back to somewhat normalcy. So yeah, well, thanks again, every everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Coach Brown. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and your inspiration. <laughs> And Shifty, terrific job. Thank you for the outreach to the teammates from 1961. Perhaps we can get a reunion together in 2021 for the 60th anniversary. Want to invite you all uh, to join us again for a Maccabi USA at Home event uh, this coming Tuesday, <laughs> July 28th. Uh, we have Michael Newman. Uh, he's the uh, winner of the Million Dollar Mile and uh, Endurance Challenge Specialist. And then next Saturday, the 1st of August at 9 p.m. Eastern, we have Havdallah. We'll share the conclusion of Shabbat together. Thanks for joining Maccabi USA at home. Stay safe. Stay well, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thanks again. Thanks, 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.